My name is Gabriel Johns and I'm here representing Punk Globe Magazine, a Ginger Coyote Magazine, Punk Globe Magazine. And I'm really, really excited today to have uh, Ricky Mamie from Brian Jonestown Massacre. Um, it's going to be a swell in conversation. Um, recording so you'll be able to see this up on YouTube and um, yeah so we're just waiting for him right now oh here we go here we go I'll tell you that all later anyway ladies and gentlemen Ricky Mamie hello Ricky are you there can you hear me you're coming coming aboard I see your name there you are. Can you hear me okay? Hello. There we go. I can hear you. How are you going? Good. How are you? Yeah, fine. Thanks. Did you get a good night's sleep? you feel better? Uh, yeah, well, it's, yeah, I'm feeling a bit better. Yeah, it's been a full day here. It's 10 p.m. Wow. Yeah, you're yeah. not morning. You're, wow, 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 wow. Um, how are you? Yeah, pretty good. And you? I'm really good. I'm really good. Um, we're really excited here at Punk Lope Magazine to have you aboard today. And um, tell me. Well, I appreciate that. Thank you. Ricky Mamie? Mimey. Mimey. There you but go. But everyone says Mamie, so it's cool. <laughs> but I want to I, I wanna, uh, pronounce it correctly, so Mimey. Thank you. That's great. Tell me, what are you all about? How did you become a musician? Are you an Ooh. artist? Are you an icon? Ooh, um, gosh, I guess that's for other people to decide. You know, I, I'm, I'm an artist of sorts. Yeah, I mean, I make music. I've been making music for a long time. I've been making records since uh, the very early 90s. And um, yeah, made, made a bit of a life of it without having to um, kind of go through the mill like a lot of people do. So I'm glad about that. Right. You broke up there for a second. Oh. So. I have a strong recording of you going on, so maybe okay. just, um, anyway. Um, tell me. Tell me about how you got into Brian Jones' Cell Massacre. Oh, right. Well, um, yeah, let's see. I had a friend named Arrow, this kid named Arrow, who uh, I was playing music with, and he was really great. He was a singer-songwriter guy, and uh, we were playing together. And he was like, yeah, you're really good, but, but I need someone a bit better than you, but you should play with my mate, Anton. <laughs> so, well, let me introduce you to him. And I was like, yeah, uh, yeah, uh, okay, sure. So he introduced me to him. And, um, and he was a really interesting guy straight away. And, you know, we clicked. And, uh, but we also, um, I don't know, had our, maybe some reservations too. But I uh, introduced him to my friend, Travis, who I was playing with, because he was more of a beginner at the time. And I thought that was more what Anton needed at that time uh, than someone like me. Um, so they started playing together and within 48 hours, they had like an album's worth of songs wow. demo. And that was so exciting and the music was so good. And they were so jazzed about it that I was, I was like, okay, well now I wanna play with you guys. <laughs> so, so we started this thing. You guys kind of hit the ground running, did you? It was just like, yeah. meet, we're gone, we're recording, um, we're, pu we're putting something out. Yeah, well, um, that's pretty lucky for us. You got to remember in the early 90s in San Francisco. This was that you still had You still had a climate of, uh, you know, WIA offices and things like that in town. Warner Electra Asylum, right? right? So you had these these guys having their showcase gigs, and they had their A and R people, and they had band. They were signing local bands in San Francisco at this time, you know. So we were born in a climate of of this kind of activity being commonplace. You meet people who were in bands on Island Records or Geffen Records who didn't have a record out yet, and you know, a year down the track, you find out they never had a record. It never came wow. out, even though they had the record deal and they had the flat and they had the video and they had the, you know, they made the record with just some expensive ass producer or whoever. And then it all just kind of falls flat for one reason or another, you know? 
the a r guy moves on by the time the record's ready and now they're on to this other thing or yeah. whatever. This was really commonplace stuff. For the 90s, I know the 90s were pretty tumultuous about people coming to see you and then getting signed and nothing happened. <laughs> That's right. So Anton was more aware of this stuff and more astute about it all at the time than the rest of us. He was a bit older and he'd been on the scene a bit longer and he was from LA and played in bands down there from an early age. So he kind of had this knowledge firsthand that we, it was all pretty new for us, you know, the rest of us who were a bit younger. And so um, after a few years of that, um, you know, sort of going out to lunch with guys from Sony or whatever, and Anton just giving them a right, dress them down, you know, we're, we're, suddenly we're all paying for our own lunch, you know, kind of thing. <laughs> yeah, so, you know. Yeah. What did you so, get picked up by first? Pardon? Who did you get picked up by first? Well, we didn't really get picked up by anybody per se. What happened was um, we, we had demo tapes floating around and uh, they'd get a lot of airplay on local college radio, KUSF. Uh, what was his name? Germ, Germ's Demo Derby or whatever. He played, always played us on the demo show. So we were kind of, you know, people would ring it. You know, Who the hell was that? Oh, this local band. We don't know anything about them. They're called Brian Jones, Time Master, whatever, right? That kind of thing. And so uh, we were already kind of getting little zine reviews of these tapes, you know. Um, and what was a bad review to one person was not such a bad review to another, right? Right, exactly. No bad so, friends. So what happened was, as this guy was ripping us a new one in this review, <laughs> Greg Shaw read it and was very intrigued. Nice. And after we played our first gig in San Francisco on the anniversary of the death of Brian Jones, we proceeded to break up the next day because we didn't like the way it all went down. And then I think about five minutes later we find a letter from bomb records saying hey we read this really bad review of you guys and we want to put out a record <laughs> that is great. too rich wow classic right yeah. so and you know we're all you know most of us are 18 you know 19 just you know on acid all day every day and you know young and carefree san francisco early 90s you know hippie punk new wave nice. weirdo kids right so um so yeah, so it's like, okay, well, Bomp's into it. And, and I think we actually, that's right. We sent Bomp a tape and I think they kind of, they found it and probably didn't think much of it until they read that shitty review. And then they were like, oh, we got a tape of those guys. And they checked it out and, and they were into it. And we sent them a tape because they'd put out Spaceman 3 as well as The Damned. And so to us, that was kind of like, you know, two very, particularly important points. So that label kind of made sense to us. And then also the more we learned the history of Greg Shaw, it, it really made sense to be aligned with a guy like that. But, you know, we also, you know, heard a million bad things before we ever even met him from, you know, every Tom, Dick and Harry who had been in a band for yeah. however many years, right? Yeah. Had their stories, right? So our thing was like, okay, well, we want to do this, but we want to do it our own way. So we're going to have our own label called Tangible Records, uh, manufactured and distributed by Bomp Records. Wow, cool. So, so we stay in control of our stuff. It's not yours, it's ours kind of thing. And that was all Anton's idea. And Anton has been that way forever. Um, really smart because now he's got, you know, 27 albums out or whatever. And, and it doesn't have to talk, doesn't have to deal with anybody owning anything. It's all him, you know, so right. it's a good way to go. That, that is awesome. Um, yeah, I know you're, how I know you is from uh, KXLU. You used to get a lot of okay. airplay on KXLU and I was like, who is this band? And yeah. um, you've also, wow, it, it's amazing that psychedelic, you come on psychedelic in the 90s, it's kind of like you made that work. You well, made that work and it was, it was a, a hard genre, but it happened for you guys. 
Well, I don't know that that's what we were consciously trying to do, psychedelic per se. You know, we were more, I mean, sure, we were aware of that in, in the sense of, you know, Piper at the Gates of Dawn and whatnot, and, you know, Magical Mystery Tour and Satanic Majesty's Request. Obviously, okay. you know, these are reference points. But they weren't sort of end all, be all, we have to be just like this. It was really more about incorporating the spirit of that and the mindset of that, because it was the mindset behind what created all of that that allowed all of this sort of wild, whimsical, crazy stuff to happen, this mishmash of ideas, you know? Um, so, you know, and that's sort of the whole thing with Brian Jones, that with it being, you know, a symbol in our name, it's, it's really, it's not about, you know, go get a haircut just like Brian Jones. It's more like, take a look at everything this guy kind of represents, right. everything he stood for, and the sort of, and the mystery and the controversy around him, around this enigmatic character who, you know, even to this day, you know, with all the information out there, he's still a pretty mysterious character, you know? Yes, yes. Mixed, mixed with the idea of, you know, um, cults and cultures and, you know, um, people's ability to, influence culture or influence the society one thing i noticed about the band is that when you guys are sometimes labeled as psychedelic you guys had yeah. songs you had a style you had a rhythm you had this is oh i know who that is that's yeah. what it was on massacre it's not oh who is this i can't yeah. really make it out Yes, yeah, so you, you might have that sometimes. There's there's a few forays here and there, but you but your point is taken and it's true. And also, um, the thing that about that is is what it really is, is it's I mean, and you know I think my bandmate Anton would would agree with this. It's it's rooted in in traditional folk art. You know when you break it down, yes. when you look at the songs and the structure and the nature of them, uh, the influence behind it. You know that's really what's going on there however you dress it up, whatever effects pedals you put it through or haircut you give it or shirt you put on it, it's, it is what it is, right? So it's, it's folk art and it's, it's, yes. folk, it's like art for the it. folk. I, do, right? I totally get what you're saying there. Yes. Whether it's psychedelic or it's, this one's kind of glam or, or this one's kind of post-punk, this one's kind of new wave, whatever, you know, it, it still that it, that still applies to all of it, really. You know, because right. that's all it, it becomes. It all becomes this. You know, over time. You know, when you look at, you know, how shoegaze bands of the '90s are now on their, you know, their 25th anniversary tour. You know, remember shoegaze when whatever. It's like it's right. a folk art. It's this pastime. You know, and that's kind of, I guess, what we're doing in a way is we're kind of keeping certain spirits of music and, and tradition alive you know in this, in some way on some level and i think that's kind of that's kind of always been in there when we first started um even with the, the 60s kind of imagery we were very much more directly influenced by things like echo and the bunny men and joy division and chameleons and yes things like that you know we, we were referencing that much more than anything else you know? I like that. That's 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 a great note to put on. Um, yeah, because you guys were more than just a psychedelic band. You you had great songs. You had a feel, and you didn't. We're into everything. That's cool. You know right. what I mean. And the funny thing is about bands is like you know, if you look at certain bands, they're that sound. The Ramones was that sound. This was right. how the Ramones sound. This was how Echo sound. Echo and the Bunnymen. Look, you brought up. This is their sound. But you, you kind of went off the charts a couple of different times, no? Yeah, well, it's just you get into different, different gears with it. You, you're mining the 60s influence or you're mining the 80s influence or even sort of reacting against things happening around you at the time, you know? Um, wow. But it, it's all, it, it's all, it all sort of has some kind of consistency in there because it's still going through the same, I guess, thought process, you know, in right. the creation of it. How was the audience reacting to everything? Were you getting a 
a buzz? Was there a buzz about you? Do you remember that, how that came like, oh yeah, we got a little buzz going on, we want to play here, we packed the club. Yeah, well, you know, we, um, again, again, we were, we were in this climate of, of you know, bands who, were, who had record deals that nobody had heard of. And so a lot of, there was a lot of competition. There was an air of competition on the scene because of this. And so bands were really vying for, you know, audiences. And it was always, you know, sort of like, oh, how many people did you guys pull sort of <laughs> thing, right? But, you know, I'll tell you what, from the very first gig, we must have had, you know, 250, 300 people, 300 people in there on the night. And it was just that way every fucking, oh, sorry, every time we played from that point on, it just was because we were really good at um, promoting ourselves. We were really, and much to uh, the resentment of a lot of other local bands because we were, we were kind of a bit more daring, you know, than they were. And um, maybe a bit more, um, you know, our, our thing was to be, we wanted we had to be the band that was too hot to handle nice you know? i like that we had to be the band that you know you didn't want to leave them alone in the room with your girlfriend or your wife you know? <laughs> like you, these don't try you can't trust these guys they're dangerous you know kind of That's vibe excellent. you know what, you know and it was really just implied more than anything it wasn't like we were so dangerous but it was sort of but this was sort of implied through the, just the way we presented our whole thing so um, you know, we even on our early posters, um, we had things written on them like "It's your children we're after." <laughs> That's hilarious, you know? right? And we and, and, it, and on the same poster, it would say "Take acid now," and then t tiny little letters and "Come see the Brian Jones Town Massacre at whatever club, Peacock Lounge, whatever." So also, you know, there were a lot of b billboards around town, and we would take over billboards. We do a lot of guerrilla art advertising with billboards like Newport cigarette billboards you know like right you know like they got the African-American couple in their action shot at the park or whatever on the billboard and they're smiling and they're smoking and so we'd sort of you know wide out their eyes and give them devil horns and make them hold a pitchfork and give them a pointy tongue and you know just and turn it and instead of Newport pleasure you turn it into Pol Pot's pleasure penthouse nice. and then you know make a flyer out of it for your con next concert you know things like that Right. Uh, there was one that was there was one that had a missing girl child you know how's little debbie gonna get home tonight you know, <laughs> after after the brian jones town massacre show at you know whatever place we you know we would take these things over things like that and we would have big giant posters that we made and um because one of the guys worked at miller freeman publishing so he had access to all these great you know printers and stuff like that so uh, we we right. this giant. You got a lot of the support behind you. I'm not leaving. I can see you. Here, yeah. Oh, right. Um, so um, anyhow, making posters was no problem, and we would um, we would shellac them to to the pavement. So you'd see them on the ground. You know, on the on the sidewalks, they'd just be these giant posters instead of on the wall, well, like everyone else's posters. That they were on the you know, on the right. floor on the ground, as well as on the walls. So we just had our stuff everywhere. Everyone knew who we were without seeing, having seen us kind of Are you thing. talking about San Francisco or are you talking about Amer across America? Oh no, just in San Francisco, just when we were first starting. And also, um, we, we got real friendly with um, people at the Art Institute, San Francisco Art Institute. Right. And so we would, we invi invite, and would invite them to the shows and, and say, hey, just bring your, projector your your eight millimeter film projectors bring your slide projectors bring all your visual stuff your lights whatever you're working on get into the show and we'll set up this whole auditory audio visual environment you know we're, so between bands you got Ravi Shankar playing through the quadruple releases and you got wow you know all this all this you know multi-layered overlapping projection film slideshow so there surround was stuff going on and so this got a lot of people in in the creative arts around town young people aware of our band and participating in our events and and this is how you get a lot of people you know excited about something like this and you know we would just you know anytime we met pretty girls we would just invite we figured well if they come the boyfriends will come so everybody right. will come 
there you they go. Come, there everybody you go. Will be there. That's amazing that you, you, you connected with that outlet, kind of like that New York vibe. Let's make the music with the art, um, visual well, art. It's, it's New York, but it's also, and it's funny, uh, I was just watching an interview today, a documentary about the Tubes, and they, they did the very same thing in San Francisco in the early 70s at the Art Institute. Uh, same sort of thing, you wow. know, doing a uh, mixed media presentation. Uh, yeah, so that's very much how we began. And it, so it, that was always an important component in what we were doing, you know, early on. So people got pretty excited about it. Yeah, coming to our shows because it felt like a happening. It felt like the factory, you know. It felt like that kind of thing. I, I love. I just love that. That's really amazing and really smart on your on your behalf to do that mm -hmm. and all that. Who writes the material? All of you. Anton's the songwriter. He's the songwriter. He's God. the leader. He's the head honcho. There you go. There you go. Yeah. I'm, so I'm gonna have to ask this: What happened to the ten years spent when you left? What What happened in that ten year stint? Yeah, you were Ant gone from the band from the Yeah, Anton, Anton kept it going uh, with pretty much all new guys. Um, some guys had come back who'd left, and they'd, they'd come back after Travis and I left. And um, they carried on, and they did quite well in terms of, you know, being very prolific and releasing some pretty high-quality albums in a pretty short space of time and because of that 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 got them a bit of attention and they were also starting to get pretty decent live and they did their first u.s tour i think in 1996 which was a okay. good three years after i'd left it might have been 96 97 somewhere in there and they uh were doing the hard yards. They were paying the dues and they were picking up the bad habits along the way. And right. so, you know, when I look at it that way, and then of course, right when all this is happening, a young budding filmmaker turns up who's decided they're making a documentary about up and coming bands. And Anton says, why don't you just make a movie about my band and this, these other people's bands? Wow. And she agreed to that. That's and then amazing. she followed them, those two bands, for the next seven years and filmed them pretty much the entire time. So she edited down seven years of material footage into a two and a half hour film that. Uh, and that was called, the film was called um... Dig. It was Dig, yes. Yeah, okay. and it it sort of morphed along the way, and as the relationship between her and the band did the same, and at the end of it, it got entered into the Sundance Film Festival uh, in the competition for documentaries. Wow. And it was up against the Metallica documentary and all this other stuff, and it won the wow. Grand Jury Prize which uh, resulted in a uh, deal with Palm Pictures distribution. So it had a proper international theatrical release. That's amazing. Which, I mean, it's just the craziest shit, right? So um, the movie wasn't out yet when I came back to the band, but it was finished. And it was, the release was imminent. I think it came out maybe a, a year and a half later, finally, yeah. officially. But it had been floating around for quite some time before that. It had been we'd all seen, seen enough of it to know we didn't think it was that great. Um, <laughs> seen enough of it to know we weren't that happy with the way it was shaped into a, a story that was clearly not the initial intention of the filmmaker going into the project. So, right. you know. Right. Um, where's, um... BJ, I'm going to now. What, 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 what are we doing? I know you came out with something, what, about a year or two years ago? Uh, just the other day, actually. Just the other day, wow. New album came out on the 24th. It's called Fire Doesn't Grow on Trees. And it's on A Recordings, which is Anton's label. Nice. And um, we have a show in Austria 
we're headlining some festival in Graz, Austria. The Graz Festival, I think it has another name actually, but I, I can't think of what it is. Um, that's on July the 17th. Nice. And then we haven't got another gig until August 20, I want to say 28th, but I could be slightly off there. In a similar situation, we're headlining a festival in um, Veve, Switzerland, just outside of um, wow. Geneva or Montreux. So on Lake Geneva, on the east um, side. So are we we've got these it? one-offs, these one-off festival right. slots. And then, um, then we have a European tour, a proper European tour coming up in the second half of September. And then that goes through the middle of October. And then we have the holidays off until February. We do a UK tour and a few more dates around Europe. And then I think that's it for a while. They're talking about um, other tours later down the track in 23. I don't know if I should mention them yet. So um, That's up to you if you want to mention them. But I would sure like to see you guys here in America. Well, we just did it. We just did a U.S. tour. We just did a tour with um, Mercury Rev, and we we uh, we did it. When was that? It was March. It started March twenty something, twenty seventh, I think, and then it went to May eleventh. So it was a pretty long North American tour. Nice. I had a, I had with many ups and downs. It was a bit of a roller coaster. Okay. okay. That that's amazing. Um, God, how did I miss that? Um, I don't know. Where were you, man? Uh, sleeping, waking life up. Life is crazy, I know. It's... Life, life has been intense since this whole COVID thing went down. Exactly. But it's, it's, it's since, since the whole thing happened, I've been incredibly busy. Oh, um, well, good for you. Working on my own music and all that. So, you know, um, I think it happened to a lot of other bands that they could really, like, shut down. Everything was shut down. They can really focus on... Who we are? What are we? Sure. What do we want? What do we want when we come out of this mess? You know, and I think that yeah. was really good. So you were, you kind of were out of the uh, out of the country during the whole shake. No, down. no, no, no. I was in America. I was stranded in my homeland, which was a really weird feeling because, under normal circumstances, I spend very little time there for many years. So I'm not really accustomed to being in America for more than a week or two at a time with several months in between. So it was pretty odd. It was like a twilight zone, you know, oh. whoa, I'm here until further notice. And I couldn't remember the last time that had been the case. Right. We're talking decades. Yeah. You know, so it really was doing my head in. Plus I have a son in Western Australia, so totally doing my head in, right? So right. I missed two birthdays, that's not cool. Oh. Um, yeah, just things like that, you know, like my life is kind of strewn about the planet and it's been that way for a long time. That's amazing. So, I love that. Um, so I don't really do well being parked in any one place for very long, no matter right. what, where it is or what's going on. I, I, traditionally, I have to get up and go after a couple months at the most, usually. You spend a lot of time in Europe, right? Well, I have done, yeah, for one reason or another. Lately, I've been spending a lot of time in Germany, in Munich, so. And, you know, my bandmate lives in uh, Berlin. Oh, okay. So that kind of helps me. You ever run into Texas Terry? Pardon? You ever run into Texas Terry? I don't know who that is. Oh, look her up, but she lives in Berlin right now. Texas, Texas Terry. Terry. Awesome. She's a friend of mine. Um, okay. She was, um, how got Texas Terry? You saying I would text on horse heads? Uh, very good. Okay. Friend. Very around okay. 80, late 80s, 90s. Uh, yeah, a little ahead eight. of my time, maybe. A little before my time. Yeah. Yeah, I think it was right before that you were coming. Yeah, she's, she lives in Berlin right now. Does she know Anton? She probably does. She probably yeah, knows okay. Anton. He doesn't really go out, but yeah, just curious. Yeah. Anyhow, yeah. So that's wonderful. So what? What? So there's something new that just came out. Is it released here? And what is it called? Fire grow. Fire doesn't grow yeah. on trees. That's yes, what it's called. Got it. Got it. Got it. How is it doing so far? Uh, that's a good question. I don't know. I, I would imagine it's in some kind of 
vinyl chart in the UK at the very least. Right. Um, you know, the band does sells okay. I know they, um, yeah. you know, when an album comes out, they'll probably press up, you know, I, I don't know, I'm sure at, at the very least. Five I love or it ten, that. Probably, I love probably more, I don't know. Right. I love it that when your band's name is mentioned, you know, the ears go up, you know, so people really know who you are, you know, <coughs> know who BJM is. Hard one. Pardon me? Hard one, hard one I said. Yes, it's like, uh, it's, it's happening. And I love that, that you guys kept the, the thing going on because we're in such, music is such a weird thing in America right now. Um, yeah, well, back. it's also in the industry, you know, it's, it's, a, it's a drag to watch bands kind of, you know, young and experienced bands have these sort of careers where in the beginning they have all these advantages and leverage, you know, they get on a major label or whatever and, and it flies and, you know, they have a bit of a career at it. They make some money, they get in the charts or whatever. But, you know, it's like the more successful they are out the gate, the harder it is to kind of live it down. You know, I've had friends who had major label records, you know, their first record goes number one. You know, they're 18 and their first record goes number one on Parlophone Records. It's like, okay, well now what? <laughs> you know? right. You're screwed if you're not, now you got to be the little doggy that does the little doggy dance and jumps through the hoops to stay where you're at, maintain your position, you know, be, you know, you're only as successful as your last record when you break into that bracket of things. Right. It's, it's so even, it's even quicker than that. You know, it really, it really does a number on, on a lot of people, on a lot of bands, on a lot of people, you know, it's a mind fuck for a lot of people. And a lot of the people going through those experiences aren't really equipped or have what it takes to, to come out of it, right. you know, without a scratch, right. yeah. you know what I mean? So we were kind of lucky, you know, we, we, we didn't have anything like that happen to us. I mean, we, you know, we just kind of ate shit for years just <laughs> being single-minded about it. Right. And, you know, people, some people come and go, Anton kept it going and, you know, it's just been nonstop. So that's amazing. 30, 32 years later. Yes. With no major label woes, no, you know, the band took a decade and a half off or 25 years off and now it's coming back to play its first record from start to finish, blah, blah, blah. None of that going on. Right. No money, no money grabs, no struggle to remain vital. Or, you know what I mean? It's like yeah. 32 years later, we're still considered new music. Yes. We're still considered a vital entity. And that, you can't really plan for that and expect it to fly. That's either going to happen or it isn't. And right. for us, it has. Yeah. That is so, I give you a lot of credit that, you know, your band has it's, it's maintained this. It's maintained its, its, its integrity. And um, it's and a good example, even if you don't like the music, you know, it's a good example of, of a, another way to do it. You know, it's and that's kind of the point. It's like to show people like. You can figure this shit out your own way. You can are you slip through the cracks and find your own way forward just by right. being true to who you are and working hard and not buying into the bullshit that everyone takes you know everyone goes takes the bait you know right indeed indeed um hey, what, and i know i understand the temptation you know yeah but what's your relationship with the dandy warhols mine personally i don't really know them all that well okay. um yeah uh the, i guess the one I, I i've spoken to the most uh is the guitar player he's a nice guy yeah. um was there a rivalry going on right there or, or something? Uh, I, it's kind of the same thing as like a Beatles and Stones rivalry or a, nice. or a Blur versus that. Oasis. It's just, it, it makes good copy, right? Yes. <laughs> Stop. That's really, all, you know, because when you think about it, who's got the energy for anything more than that? Right. <laughs> right. That's amazing. You got a lighter. Thank you. That's amazing. Sorry. So yeah. do you live in a, you live abroad right now? Do you live in the? Well, right now I'm just 
Yeah, I'm I'm in Munich right now. Thank you. And um, yeah, I, I mean, I'm just kind of a rock and roll gypsy boy. I love guess. It, love it. Right. Yeah. That's amazing. And that's kind of that's kind of how that's that's how I sort of function best. I think. I think yeah. um, if I'm just sedentary, if I'm just in one spot for too long, I'm not really uh, firing on all cylinders. You know, if if I have momentum to keep up with in my life, which normally I do, you know, sans pandemic, then then I'm sort of meeting my higher calling and I have nice. You know, I have better flow. Things are more optimal, you know. I find uh, a lot of serenity from me just talking to you. Um, mm. Great. You know, I just, it's, it's, it's a nice, just a nice thing, a vibe about you. You seem very like down to earth, covering nothing up, and this is it. This is what I do. This is what who I am, and um, I like that very much. Do you have anything yeah. to say to the audience, to Punk Globe Magazine? Oh well, um, I've just come back from Scotland and I was making a record that I wasn't even planning on making until I got there and I just found myself in this situation making it right. with a guy named Rusty Byrne and he's from a band you may have heard of called the Fire Engines. Okay. The Fire Engines uh, were and are a, a highly influential post-punk band from Scotland. They were on a label called Fast Product. Okay. You may be aware of who they did. You know, they did the Scars. They did Gang of Four in the beginning. They did wow. Nikon's Human League, like before anybody. They put records out by these guys. So they were in that group of bands, and they are cited as a as a major influence to the Jesus and Mary Chain. You know, all sorts wow. of creation records, Alan McGee sort of artists, all that sort of thing. So they're they're kind of a, a pioneer in this kind of indie noisy scottish thing a seminal band and uh they were covered not that long ago by franz ferdinand they did a okay. single that was covered nice. by the fire engines so rusty uh from the fire engines and i and a guy named uh coco who was in a band called uh the gin goblins punk band they okay. were produced by rat scabies from the dam okay i know um, rat scabies yeah yeah so coco and rusty and i have this project with a singer named Heather who uh, she's Scottish lass and nice. the project's called Scorpio Leisure. Nice. And when does it come cool. out? Uh, that's a good question but these guys seem to work pretty fast so it could, it could happen before the end of the year and uh, yeah. Um, I love that that you surround yourself with things that are moving, constantly moving, mm. um, yeah. which is an interesting thing that a lot of people are can become so complacent with what's going on. Um, mm. I'm I don't an action know man. I'm a man you, of action. Uh, man of action, yes. Yeah. Um, which I think is something you really have to keep going. Um, but it's, yeah. to you, it seems to come naturally. It's like you already know the next thing to do without really knowing it. Let's talk about Zen. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Do without doing and everything gets done. Sure. Well, that's that's exactly right. You, I, that's that's very uh, astute observation because these are things that are very much on my mind regularly, and um, it's and it's a lot to do with how things come to be in my life. You know, flow, creative projects, yeah. you know, the good flow. Um, hey, you know, I, 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 I don't know. I apologize. We have one minute to say goodbye. You're joking. I think no. it was just about to get interesting. Oh my God! Are you kidding? Let me no. see if I can upgrade <laughs> this at the moment right now. I don't think I can. I was going to talk to you about Chinese punk. I was going to talk to you about San Francisco in the 70s and 80s. I was going to talk to you about Let's all this other stuff. Can, can we hang up and I'll call you right back? Sure. Great, great. Let's do okay. that. All right. Sounds good. Call you right back. Okay. Hey, Ricky. Can you hear me? There he is. Hello. Oh, can, yeah, okay. Can you hear Hi me? Hi there. Right? Yeah, we got it. How are you going? It's going good. It's going good. How are you? Yeah, all right. Thanks. A star on your, uh, on your shirt? Oh, I have, I have an Edinburgh Festival, Edinburgh Festival t-shirt. No, oh, I have a Motorcycle Boy t-shirt. Oh, we both have stars on our oh, t-shirts. Uh, the stars are aligned. Far up. 
<laughs> Gabriel from Punk Globe Magazine here with Ricky Miami, and yeah. uh, we're ready to start off right now. What have you been doing lately? Um, let's see. Oh, one moment. <laughs> lately, I've been um, listening to some mixes back of uh, some recordings. I've been working on with some different people. Uh, one is that man. I was different from Brian Jonestown. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Um, one is actually Ed, from Edinburgh. It's that band Scorpio Leisure. I've been working with with uh, one of the guys from Fire Engines, Rusty from Fire Engines. You told me about them. Yeah. So I've been listening to some mixes of that. It sounds really good. And uh, some mixes of this other project called Foam Giant, which is um, members of the Flavor Crystals with Steve and Laurie from the Telescopes. Okay. And various other contributors. Uh, are you producing these these tracks? No, just um, playing playing guitar basically. Nice. Yeah. Got it. Nice. How do they sound? Are you happy? Yeah, great. I mean, it's good stuff. It's and it's not really the kind of stuff I would necessarily come up with on my own or with you know other people. So it's it's pretty unique. To what you know to itself, so that's cool. I like that. That's an interesting thing. What is your go-to thing that you would like to do, or are you doing it? I don't know. That's a good question, actually. Um, I mean, I like all the stuff I've done or do, you know. But there's always other things that that are interesting that that you might like to try to dip your toe into or whatever, you know. Yeah. Um, I, know, I mean, I like to listen to a lot of uh, Japanese tango music. <laughs> wow, that's interesting. interesting. Yeah, you know, because um, it's just it's such another world, right? So, you know, and I listen to a lot of disco, and I listen to a lot of uh, like Japanese disco, basically, pretty much late seventies, early eighties, nice. stuff like that. You know, party jams. I like party jams. Yeah. Yeah. I'd like to make some party jams, but like really good ones, like really oh, interesting, right. tasteful ones, you know? Yeah, that's really interesting because I would love to do a dance mix of um, of uh, Ian Hunter's um, Is There Life After Death with, uh, uh, with um, oh my God, shares, um, do you believe, believe, do you believe? Oh, oh, oh. I don't know, but I hate you. Oh, oh, sorry. But um, yeah, but matter. yeah, whatever. There's any 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 kind of you know perverse idea you can come up with right around this thing and yes. kind of repurpose it somehow. <laughs> yeah, I don't know how that thought came into my head. I just went, all oh, these two songs would be great mashed together. But mm. anyway, back to you. Um, so yeah, so wow, that's that's a pretty diverse thing from one end to the other. Yeah, the the uh, Scorpio. Leisure album has kind of a party jam vibe, but kind of like a late night one, you know, like a Portishead thing, but on a, Portishead on a whole lot of acid. Wow. <laughs> or something like that. Uh, yeah. And then the Foam Giant thing is more like a, some kind of, I don't know, some kind of weird, like a movie, sound, film soundtrack, but, and it has synthesizers, but it's, but it's pretty, uh, warm sounding where are you going to record this are you in uh, it's already record it's already recorded all that stuff recorded. recorded yeah we already did all that yeah. where did you record it oh well the foam giant stuff was done in um uh minneapolis actually just outside of minneapolis at a studio called um pachyderm pachyderm studios okay. and it's uh it's a place where steve albini did a lot of work. He did. He did Nirvana records there, and he did um, PJ Harvey, a bunch of stuff. Um, so it's Pixies. Yeah, it's well known. Yeah. yeah, yeah. So you know it, okay? Yeah. So we yeah. did it there, and uh, and then this other uh, stuff, the Scorpio Leisure stuff, we just did it at Rusty Studio in Edinburgh, Scotland. Okay, there you go. So you're around. You get around the world. That's great. That's awesome. Yeah. Thank goodness for that. So what else are we? What else are you doing up to this point? I know you're doing something in China, right? Yeah, yeah. Well, not at the moment because of the restrictions. Um, you know, they're not letting anyone in or out. So um, 
that's all on hold. You know, I have a band there. I play in a band there with some kids who, uh, you know, I started playing with them because I was producing their re their other bands. And um, the name of the band? Our band is called Baihu, B A I H U, and that's with guys from a band called Bird Striking. Right. Bird and Striking. One of, one, of, one of the guys also has another band called Gate to Other Side. <laughs> nice. So I produced both their records. I produced Gate to Other Side and Bird Striking. And how, did you, how did you come around to finding these bands? Did they come to you? Did you happen to just like hear them and go, man, I want to be involved? Yeah, well, um, it started with getting exposed to the music in Australia about 10 years ago with a uh, Chinese Australian friend of mine who was visiting relatives for the first time in China. Wow. And being the, uh, his name's Julian Wu, he's a really great guy. And uh, being the big music lover that he is, he, uh, he went around scoring every CD he could of every underground indie Chinese band, punk band he could find. Because uh, there's not a lot of vinyl. Uh, there is now there, but back then there wasn't because there were no pressing plants in China because of the Cultural Revolution. A lot of the stuff they were getting had to be manufactured from outside of China anyways. But, um, this stuff doesn't really get, didn't really get distributed around China very easily, but he was able to find a couple shops that had, had a lot of this stuff. And he brought it back from China and uh, played me a bunch of this music in wow. Australia one time. We were driving around in Melbourne in his car and he's kind of DJing on the iPad, all the stuff he ripped into his computer, you know, all these great bands. So I fell in love with all this music, you know, it really hit me like a wave, you know, just like, just like in the late eighties getting turned on to, creation or flying down anything like that so um same kind of thing and i hadn't really ha had such an impression made on me since that time you know by a whole sort of scene of young bands because i couldn't really place in my mind when the last time a, a whole youth culture had such a a, a ring of, of unification to it where there's a sort of undeniable thing happening with kids that's exciting and dangerous and unpredictable you know, because we don't really we don't really have that in the West for a long time. You know what I mean? Because everything's so uh, you know uh, conservative. Yes, very, so, uh, very true. Um, yeah. Was everything sung in, in in Chinese? Well, a lot of it is. A lot of it is. And it just depends. You know, when they don't want their friends to know what they're singing, they sing in English. <laughs> but uh, you know, a lot of times you'll have you'll have just the verse is in Mandarin and the chorus is in English or, or just the name of the song is in English and everything else is Mandarin, any variation of, you know? Right. But, you know, you get a lot of other things too where they'll start singing in French or something. So here's Asian pop in a Western style with French language that they really have this hybridization thing that kind of comes naturally. They, or they, they can do it in a way that seems more artful and less try hard and, patched together the way it might do if it was a bunch of, you know. That's interesting. Hip white kids who, who were too cool for school and. Right, you know, right. Um, Trevor, Trevor types. <laughs> it's, not, it's, it's interesting that you say that because, you know, just me being in here in America, it's just like, God, um, I have a daughter and she pretty much listens to everything I was listening to. Mm. You know, it's just like. Thank so goodness for that. I, I, yeah, right. It's just I just don't hear any great music coming out. Not to say that there isn't, but the you know. Sure. Well, there always is. It's just finding it isn't the same as it used to be. But go on, sorry. Yeah, yeah. It, no, no, no. That's what I was just going to say. To hear something that really stands out that catches your attention, I'm always looking for something like that. And yeah, it really resonated with me on the whole. You know, it wasn't any one band in particular. It was sort of the whole group of bands putting the whole scene together in my head. Of this whole, all this stuff's happening in this place. It was, it was kind of irresistible and, you know, and I'm a, I'm a real nerdy record collector type. So I had to have my hands on this, all this stuff, you know, and um, right. ended up getting a hold of these people and getting a rapport going and started selling records for them. And, um, you know, out of my backpack and then eventually online a bit, um, sending them back the money and doing all right with it. So then uh, booking tours wow. for bands overseas from China and, you know, all the things that came from there, you just gradually step by step, you know, you're, you're distributing records, you're booking tours, you're hiring publicists, you're doing the whole thing, right? So, um, let me once, ask you something. What, what 
drew you to that? What was so different that you said, I need to be a part of this. I want to promote this. I want to be active. Yeah. In this. Was it you the know, content, the vault, the music styling? Was it um, just something fresh and new coming from youth? Yeah, you know, it's a funny thing. It wasn't like I felt like I had to do it. I don't know. I mean, I guess I, I think I, maybe I, in a weird way, I did feel like I had to do it. And I did, and I, it's hard to explain why, but um, I, re, I just fell in love with the whole spirit of the whole thing, yes. you know, and, and I, I ended up in touch with the people and we had, a, we got a really good kind of connection going. And it's just, it, it seemed like they were all kind of figuring it out as they went along too. And I liked that. I thought that was, that was cool, but, but it also made me feel like I had to kind of protect them in a way. It, there was like a, a this protective kind of angle, I guess, where I felt like I didn't want them to make bad decisions, you know, and, and have this, I didn't want, I didn't want to see them waste money on ideas that were not, not putting the best foot forward and not representing the whole thing in the right way. I thought this needed to be overseen in a, in a tasteful manner that sort of retained the integrity of what it was really all about. Because if you don't do that, if you don't sort of police the situation, then, you know, then it's just being sold to you like K-pop or something. And I wanted to make sure that didn't happen. That's interesting. That's great. That it's not a novelty and that it's, that it's real and that it's on equal footing with anything else as, as a viable, vital, distinct, uh, and meaningful thing, you know, significant when thing in, in music history full stop let alone in chinese music history yeah. but but in popular culture in in rock and roll full stop you know nice no. and that it's and that it's rooted in punk and and the sort of left of center thinking it, it really it's it just made it all the more important somehow to me that it was it needed to be delivered in an artful manner, you know. That's interesting that you, uh, that took such interest and such care. Because mm. pretty much down here, we don't care about shit. You know, we just put right. it up and hope it, hopefully it's signed. It, it sells. And we don't even get that chance here anymore. Um, it's, all, yeah, I mean, it's all digital. It's all digital for me. We were offered distribution deals we turned down because they were basically just designed to put the label out of business and not uh, no. really you know, it not really accomplish much of anything we couldn't ultimately accomplish on our own with a, a bit of patience and perseverance, you know. Um, it was so much better to keep things DIY and done out of a backpack. It's almost like you should do that every chance you get. <laughs> right. you go. From what I can tell, from what I've learned, that's, you can't go wrong, you know. There you go. When did you start doing this? What, what were the years? That was 10 years ago, 2012. 2012. And you know, I already had a bit of um, practice kind of selling self-released records of my own. And so I knew, I knew people in indie shops and I knew, knew how to sort of, you know, get music where it needed to get to, you know, depending on what the audience is or whatever. So um, between knowing the guys in the shops from being a record nerd and collecting records and buying records, and also selling them records or putting records in their shops to be sold or what have you. You know, I, I, I felt like I had a, a handle on where and how to sell this stuff. Is this stuff here in America yet? Well, it was, but you know, um, the labels I was working with did what all successful indie labels do and sold themselves off to bigger labels. Right. So, uh, one in particular, anyhow, and um, you know that's good for them that the they make good on their investment and all that. Right. You know, just like Creation Records sold to Sony, you know, maybe Mars, the label I was working with, the, the prime label I was working with, uh, that with, with uh, funding behind it and everything. Um, after they did whatever it was, sixty or seventy albums. Yeah. They sold to a big label called Tai Hu, which is the biggest Chinese label. So what Tai Hu does is they go around buying up indie labels, just like, you know, wow. just like all the labels getting bought up in the West, you know. 
Well, so all these indie labels are signing up all these bands, so they have equity, so they have a big catalog, so it's what they, they can go for more money on the market to the bigger labels when they go to sell their label. Right. That's what, what it was all coming down to in the end, was not how, how many great bands you had, but just how many bands you had. Right. See? So, so it was just like, a, a, this, a, it got to this point where every band was just getting snatched up by someone. Right. Was that discouraging or any setbacks for you on, on your endeavor? Well, it's definitely, it definitely did something to the quality control overall. But what it did for my little distribution company was it just killed it. Because once the, the little label got absorbed by the big label, the big label decided that they weren't interested in the international market. Wow. That there's enough people in their own market to just focus on that. So mm -hmm. that means who cares about manufacturing and exporting product to be sold to wow. you know people in the West. So that all kind of came to a close when the money came in. You know, it must have been frustrating. Well, yeah, it was. Not for me, any for any reason for me directly, but just for this kind of thing we created, you know, because um, we did have a lot of eyes on it. Uh, up to that point, you know, we had pretty steady orders for things, and that's yeah, it wasn't like a big, wasn't a big money making business, but it was certainly if it was attended to properly, it was kind of keeping itself going. And you know, it's it, that's a big can of worms. I don't, I don't really mind. It, it got it got going well enough that we had to have other people step in to run it because nice, we were. The guys, my, me and my partner, were too busy doing our other things, you know, being in bands and living right, life, right. And what have you. So, um, anyhow, uh, through all of that, I ended up getting to know a lot of the bands, or you know, a fair few of the bands, tour managing them, going around the world with them uh, numerous times, and so uh, this led to being invited to China numerous times which led to being invited to produce records by some of these bands in, in china so i was being brought over there and put in the studio and with these bands and nice in, in really top studios actually and uh yeah doing doing great work that's and, awesome that is like yeah and, and that was all set to keep going but then you know what happens to everyone right. and the COVID so thing happened. Now. What happened during the, the whole time whenever when we were all in lockdown? I knew you were still in the communique with them, weren't you? I still talk to them all the time, yeah. yeah. We talk on WeChat. Nice. Yeah, we don't use Facebook so much because they don't have, they, I mean, they can use it if, if they have a VPN, but they don't always have that. So. Right. Yeah. That's amazing. V but VPNs come and go in China. What? The VPNs come and go yeah. in China. Um, so what did you do to maintain um, the integrity of it? Was there things to do you can keep with your songs? Well, we turned down deals with big distribution companies, things like that. Pardon me? We did things like turn down deals with big distribution companies. Well, you're being offered them from, from that. Yeah. That's great. Well, yeah, because there's a catalog there, you know. Yes. Um, but yeah, it just seemed like a way to just run it into the ground and kind of lose the plot real quick. Yeah. What are you doing with it right now that we're pulling off? Well, there's still restrictions in China, right? Yeah, I was just talking to my friend today, one of the guys in bird striking. He said that uh, he'll let me know when wow. the restrictions are lifted. So are they not letting anybody in or out? I think um, pe some people are getting in and out if they have very good reason. Yeah, you know, it's special. Mm -hmm. Certain specific Boy. reasons why. Boy, it sounds really interesting. I really want to go ahead and find out these bands and give them a listen myself. Um, mm. That sounds really yeah, interesting. Well, yeah. Well, maybe Mars, the label Maybe Mars has a band camp and you can hear a lot of the stuff there. Good. And from there, you can find most of the great bands. And a lot of those bands will have their own web page or, or band camp as well. Um, or even a lot of them have SoundCloud pages. And um, also, I mean, if, if you can get down to translating some Mandarin, 
there's a, a site called Dobam, D-O-U-B-A-N. And that's kind of like a, uh, kind of like how MySpace for music was. Oh, wow. It's, it's a Chinese version of it. And all the bands are on that. And wow. a lot of them have uh, downloadable live gigs and demos. And sometimes they're whole albums. And, wow, that's interesting. Yeah. I will definitely it's check a, that out. Thank you. Do, Doban is a big, big resource for, for Chinese kids. And it's not just Chinese music. Everything's on there pretty much. Wow. Um, yeah, I might have mentioned before, I was uh, a panel judge for their music awards. Yes. A couple years in a row for the Doban Music Awards, which was kind of a big deal. I mean, it was just an online thing, but it was, it was a big deal because they, they, they sent me, they must have sent me a hundred different Wow. artists to listen through and really pick who, who the best ones were for each category. So it exposed me to a lot of Chinese artists and a lot yeah. of ones that I wouldn't normally That's great. take an interest in because maybe they're main, more mainstream or, or whatever. But you could still recognize the, you know, the raw talent who, who really had it. And so it was, it was cool to uh, get invited to do that. That more is than very once interesting, well. yeah. yeah. And that's all came from your, your friend um, out down in Australia, huh? Well, yeah. Kind of opened yeah. up a whole Funny new Funny how world. things happen, you know, you meet one person and then you go to a place with them and then you meet a bunch of other people and do all these things with them and then get to know those people and they go and do something and come back and tell you about something else and then you go and check it out and it leads to all this kind of stuff. So yeah, life's funny, you know? Yeah. That way. <laughs> it indeed. It is. Yes, I do agree with you there. Um, yeah. What are you doing like right now? Are you still doing stuff with Brian Jonestown Massacre? Or yeah, in fact, we're, right? we're rehearsing starting next week uh, for a show. We got a, a show in um, Austria, in Graz, Austria. It's just a one-off festival. And it's, um, yeah, it's, it's called the... It has a name. I just don't know what it is. <laughs> the festival. No worries. Um, no worries. Yeah. So, play that show and then, then have another sort of four, four or five weeks off, maybe. Yeah. And then, then another show. Like then that. another show. Okay. Got so it. This has been a series of one-offs over the summer, and then an actual tour coming up. So. Nice. And then an actual tour coming up. Yeah, a, a European tour. So. Nice. Nice. Because you just finished your American tour. Not too yeah. long ago, right? Yeah. Nice. Excellent. Excellent. Wow. So this whole China thing, back to it, I just find it yeah. really in almost intriguing, like Eastern intrigue, you know, like yeah. what is this about? Wow. Is it fresh? It's got to be fresh. Um, considering someone like you has come to open up our ears. Yeah. Well, you know, um, by the time I caught wind of all this stuff 10 years ago, it was already in pretty full swing um, in terms of the sort of what is now referred to as the golden era of it all. Uh -huh. I kind of caught the tail end of that, you know, it was all these bands really started picking up in sort of 2005, 2006. And by 2007, 2008, they all sort of had one or two really great albums out. And by nine, 10, 11, some of them were already on to the album three or whatever. But a lot of these bands don't make it much past that many records because they're, they're pretty much all young people and, you know, they don't have a long culture of rock and roll bohemian types, you know, and they're all, they're all educated. They all have degrees. They all, you know, have traditional wow. backgrounds and interesting, you know, you know they're, they're middle-class, you know, hardworking kids, educated kids. And so, you know, they don't, they don't really go into this thinking they're going to, you know, be the next Stone Temple Pilots or whoever the hell you want to pick. They're, none of them are, are angling for anything like that. They're, they're not trying to be queens of the Stone Age or whoever. They're, they're just having fun with their mates, trying to do something that they think is cool and that their mates think is cool. That is great. And then, and then they, all, they all basically plan on just going and doing their jobs and getting married and, you know, keeping the family sweet. And, you know, I mean, they're all pretty good kids, really, you know, but they're, that doesn't stop them from making some pretty far out, edgy, provocative music. Yeah, because I don't know, but usually I find that, you know, look at yourself as a musician, you know, 
I don't know what your, your background is in schooling, but people who are really like into it, and I don't know if it's culture in China or if it's just the way, you know, when you, you're here in America, I know a lot of guys who went to college, but are still playing, they're still playing. They're right. still out there doing gigs. They're out, they're out there touring. And um, yeah, we'll see if that happens with the Chinese kids. I hope it does. Yeah, yeah. that's what I was wondering. It, is that was part, I think that's part of my motivation for wanting to get involved with some of these kids as well, is to show them that it's not just, it doesn't have to be something you, you grow out of, like a hobby or whatever. It, like you, can, you actually can make a life of it. Yeah. And, and I think some of them were already pretty clued into that, but a, an alarming amount of them really weren't, especially considering how talented and you know, visionary some of them really are as artists and composers. So, yeah, you know, it was well, kind of... So you're kind of presenting them with this idea that it's, it's more than just uh, a fun thing to do. It's something, if you're trying to say something, you, you've got a, you've got a uh, voice. You have an open market. It could be your whole life and without trying to be a rock star to do right. it, you know, mm -hmm. just sort of, you know what I mean? Just something that's an outlook on life or, you know. Yeah. Like yeah. I, I, I get it. I'm glad you're up there doing that, trying to like really bring that awareness to the, to like, to music. You know, I know a lot of people who are like, when they're young, they says, oh yeah, I used to be a concert pianist. Mm. And it's like, what are you doing now? It's just, oh, I'm selling insurance. Right. Yeah. Wait, I'm you spent so, so much time being a concert concert pianist, playing these outrageous gigs to sell insurance. He goes, yeah, I got a family now, wife and kids, and it's just like, hmm. yeah, you can have a wife so and kids while being a concert pianist. There's a lot of talent in China, and a lot of these kids, you work with them and you find out, I mean, these kids, it's like layers of the onion, you know, you keep learning things about them. They're, they're all full of surprises, what right. they're capable of doing, what they're schooled in doing. You know, you'll be working with a band, there'll be some shit hot drummer and suddenly he gets behind the piano and you realize, oh, he grew up playing classical piano, but he's, but he really wants to sing and play guitar, even though he's this shit hot drummer. <laughs> Guy's, you know, 25 years old. And wow has a degree in, you know, whatever, accounting, you know, but is totally yeah. far out and wants to take acid and, you know, <laughs> goes crazy. <laughs> would you, you say, know, it's your, um, is, would you say it's your intention, intention to bring this awareness to China, to the Chinese kids is saying like, hey, this music is wanted. We need it. We need you. <coughs> we need your voice. Yeah, that was the initial reaction from them was, why do you care about our music when it's influenced by music from your own culture? They, they couldn't understand that because it very much was just like they were doing it essentially for one another. So, you know, I had to try to explain, you know, that even though it's, it's made up of these Western qualities, that it has a distinctly Eastern thought process behind it. Wow. You know, so you, it's... It's like, you know, giving the same ingredients to two different chefs and expecting them to make the same exact right. meal. You know, and even if they follow the same recipe, it's just not going to be the same thing, especially if it's, you know, a chef from another culture. So it's that kind of thing. Wow. That's there's enough subtle. Well. There's enough subtle differences happening to pique my interest in ways that a Western artist wouldn't because those differences wouldn't be there. Wow. That's interesting. You want to elaborate more on that? Well, I mean, first of all, there's just the phrasing. If, when they are singing in English or Mandarin, even if they're singing in English, usually it's some kind of Chinglish. So it's this poetry, you know, you know that you're not going to get, again, from a Westerner because it's incorrect English. So, um, you know, things like that for a start. And then when they are singing in Mandarin, you know, you're going to hear phrasing and vowel sounds and all kinds of subtle features that again, don't exist in Western music and the sound of it and the writing of it and the, and the thought behind it. Yeah. So, so when you're trying to get inside the, the thinking of it, it, it's, it has that impenetrable mystique that's not going anywhere because, you, you know, unless you can learn how to speak Mandarin. Right. How are they, who are they listening to? Like you said, oh, hey, we're 
Chinese kids listening to American, American influence? Is well, it American or just um, outside China influence? Here's an interesting thing about that. In the 80s, when um, Western music first started coming into China, because you know, nobody grew up with the Beatles or the Sex Pistols or any of that stuff. None of that happened. MTV, none of it. Elvis, not, nothing we think of is the history of rock, rock and roll, even in Japan or Taiwan. They don't have it in China. That didn't happen, right? right? So right. in the 80s, um, they started to have a middle class. And the middle class started taking trips to the West and returning home to China. And they'd come back and they'd have a Beatles record or a Phil Collins record or whatever record, Lionel Rich. And they're playing it for people. And, you know, so people are starting to experience this stuff. So people are be beginning to become aware of Western popular culture at this time. So, and, wow, you mean like in 2010? It was no, no, I'm talking about 1980s. Okay. So yeah. in the 80s, this is all happening in the 80s. This is the first experience of rock and roll. Okay, wow. Because no one experienced it in the 70s or the 60s. This is what I'm saying. Nobody Got grew it. up with the Beatles. Got no it. one's ever heard of Beatlemania in China, okay, right. until the 80s. <laughs> oh, wow, interesting. Right. They haven't heard of Beatlemania, let alone anything less popular <laughs> than Beatlemania. So that gives you the scale of what they don't know, right? So until the 80s. So and this is what I'm saying. People from middle, middle class Chinese are coming over to America, Europe, visiting relatives who migrated, whatever, you know, but these are like the original Chinese middle class. And then they're coming back to China because they have a, a middle class life there. They're not trying to defect or any of this stuff. And they're bringing back the Beatle records and they're bringing back the Wham UK, all this whatever, right? So who Wham UK went there and played in the 80s and they were the first ever white band to play a gig that, in China. Yeah. That was 1986, I think. Right. So um, right around this time is when you had English teachers guys like you and me who would have been just fresh out of high school or college, whatever, decide, yeah, I, I like Chinese girls, whatever. I'm going to go teach English in China. So you go over there and you don't have CDRs and you don't have the internet. So you have your mixtapes of your record collections, your killer indie rock record collection, because you're a cool college guy who wants to go to China. And when you're at home with listening to your record collection, you're listening to the Jesus and Mary chain and the velvet underground and suicide and, yeah. Stooges and My Bloody Valentine and you know all that stuff so you can't bring all your records to China you're gonna bring mixtapes so you had this wave of English teachers wow. with their mixtapes right wow and they're becoming friends with their right. students and the students are taking numbers and waiting in line to borrow their mixtape from the te English teacher right so you got this culture beginning to grow at the same time, when we had the mid 80s music industry boom, we had labels like Polygram or RCA or whatever, right. and they're, they're reissuing everything on CD and cassette, right? So they're doing whatever, they're doing Velvet Underground, you know, VU, Another View, whatever, a compilation album, you know, and they're thinking, oh, it's on CDs, so we'll press, you know, 50,000 copies of this CD. And, and flood the market with these CDs. And, you know, after they sit around in music land and the warehouse and Tower Records for, you know, a right. few years and not selling because there's not enough of an audience for this stuff or, or the Ramones or, or whatever it is, all of these excess CDs and cassettes become cutouts, right? They get a hole punch, they get a cut in the corner, whatever, right? And all that stuff gets sold as landfill to China. Wow. So, and the cut or the whole is called duku, to cut, right? So all this stuff ends up as a landfill to China. It ends up there once every three weeks in a dump in Guangzhou or whatever. And whoever's working in that dump say, you know, you got kids who know this, that this, these dumps are happening every X amount of days, wow. weeks, whatever. And they're going to the dumps and they're, grabbing stacks of this stuff 
whatever they can carry. They don't know what any of it is. They're just bringing it home, right? And also people working in these dumps and people working at these docks have their connections with street stall, you know, market people. So, so a lot of this stuff would end up in, in market stalls and they would sell it by weight. They would sell it, you know, like one quai a CD. And so I was hearing stories from kids in China, how they would queue up at these market stalls once every, you know, third Wednesday or whatever. And they're just standing there, you know, digging through tapes and CDs and just grabbing everything they can and going to the counter and paying for, for it all and just taking it home and listening to it and deciding what they liked later. I remember when I was on tour with some of these kids in America, we'd go into a record store and they'd see a bunch of cassettes and they'd go over and just grab them all. Wow. Amazing. I love it. Hey, I have two minutes and 30 seconds going on. I want to okay. ask you, is there something you'd like to say to the audience? Something what you're doing important right now? Something to bring awareness to what you're important to the band, to your projects? Oh. Anything? Oh, well, gosh, I would just say ch check out uh, the post-punk post Chinese scene. Check out Maybe Mars records. I will, yeah. check, check out Ruby Eyes records. Check out Modern Sky records and Gunjing, G-E-N-J-I-N-G. -E check out those labels because there's a lot of great uh, post-punk and hardcore punk and wow. power pop and psychedelic art rock, weirdo, freaky, lo-fi, avant-garde, folk, you name it, they do it. And it's That's all amazing. brilliant and wild and totally forward thinking and really exciting. I love it. I love that. Yeah. I love that very much. Okay, we got less than a minute. Um, Ricky, thank you so much. This is Ricky Mamie uh, hey. from Ron Jones Sound Massacre. Thank you so much. Um, again, always a pleasure to speak with you, and hopefully we can do it again sometime soon. Keep in touch, man. You have, a nice lot to to you have a lot to let us know, and I really appreciate you coming. Thank you. Likewise. I like being here. Nice Thank one. You. Have a good night. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.